And everybody, Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sundays, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with the Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern, Sundays with Andrew Zirin. It is Monday here on the show. You know what that means? Man, we got a lot to talk about here today. Busy weekend. We had the SmackDown show, which was built around the answer in all caps. Were Cody and Seth Rollins going to accept the Rock and Roman Reigns challenge for the tag team match on the first night of WrestleMania with stipulations? Well, if you did not see it, the answer is yes, they did accept. So that's been foiled. And then, of course, we had the collision show as well, which was a better collision than usual in terms of star power and matches like the show. We've got Raw coming up tonight and SmackDown on Friday. And matches for both of those shows, including what should be an awesome match tonight. It is a gauntlet match. Winner gets the shot at Gunther's Intercontinental title at WrestleMania. And this is the lineup for the guys in the gauntlet match, which should go like 45 minutes to an hour. We got Ricochet, Chad Gable, Sami Zayn, Bronson Reed, Shinsuke Nakamura, and J.D. McDonough. So that should be a good one. And then, of course, we've got all of the rest of the news from the weekend. And uh, there is plenty of it, not the least of which is Muhammad Ali going into the WWE Hall of Fame. More on the Revolution buys from last Sunday. New Japan Strong Women's Champion. Title has changed hands. We'll talk about the passing of Yutaka Yoshie with Mike. And we'll also tell you about the F4W Wrestling Observer Convention, which is coming up this May in Las Vegas. And you can go! And we'll tell you how. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. fish could swim this far offshore. Yeah. Shoulders ran like the wind, but he could find no peace. Ugh. <sighs> 
Show Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Subravivi will be here in a moment. He's rebooting. So in the meantime, we've got Raw coming up here tonight. Three matches announced for the show for the last week now. We've got a gauntlet match to determine Gunther's championship challenger at WrestleMania. Ricochet, Chad Gable, Sami Zayn, Bronson Reed, Shinsuke Nakamura, and J.D. McDonough. We have the women's tag team titles on the line. Kabuki Warriors defend against Shayna Baszler and Zoe Stark. And we have Becky Lynch versus Liv Morgan. All of that on Raw tonight. And then SmackDown, we've got The Rock appearing on the show, Rey Mysterio appearing on the show, Bailey versus Dakota Kai coming up on Friday. And they have also announced that uh, when Raw returns to Chicago, March 25th, so about three weeks from now, there will be an appearance by CM Punk. Although I don't know why they announced it now, because the show's been sold out for weeks. But you know what? If you got a ticket, he's going to be there. Maybe they can find a way to open up more seats. 11,859 out for that show at the Allstate Arena. And now CM Punk has been added. So that's the WWE lineups over the next couple of days. We actually have a card for Dynamite. We have got Samoa Joe versus Wardlow for the world title. Darby Allen, Jay White. The Elite versus Eddie Kingston, Pac, and Penta. Hook and Jericho versus the Gates of Agony and Willow Nightingale versus Riho. And then, presumably, it is the debut of Mercedes Monet. But, uh, you know, they're, they're keeping that one close to the vest. There's been uh, really no teases except for those dollar signs for the debut of Mercedes. But I'm presuming she will be there this coming Wednesday in Boston. Mike, you've made it. I'm here. I've been here. Just had well, you to just, reset you the timeline. Texted me. It was rebooting. What do you want me to do? Just presume you're not there. Well, can you tell us about Yutaka Yoshi who passed away? Suddenly. Fantastic transition, Brian. That's why you're the professional. That well, I was going to start with it, but you weren't here. All right, Yutaka Yoshi, uh, former All Japan Pro Wrestling wrestler, passed away on Sunday at the age of 50 after wrestling a match in Takasaki City along with Ryo Inoue. They lost to Hokuto Amore and Ryoji Sai. Following the match, he went backstage, was complaining of feeling ill. Uh, I saw one report say that he collapsed backstage. I'm not sure if that was the case or not, but after... Uh, some time he was taken to a nearby hospital where he ended up passing away and he was only like i said 50 years old and he was from not very far away from where he passed away from maibashi city japan which is in, in the same prefecture the gunma prefecture that the match was taking place and he was a guy that was very charismatic. He was only about 5'11", but he was as wide as the day is long. He did not start that way in New Japan. He actually debuted in 1994, I believe it was. Ended up breaking his leg in his second match, went over to Germany to get some seasoning, and they developed a sumo gimmick for him, which he ended up carrying with him throughout his career as far as how he was built and how he wrestled. He wore a very notable... You know, everybody's got their color in Japan. He actually stood out because he wore pink, and you had this big, massive man that wore pink. And unfortunately for him and his time in New Japan, he never really got a chance to break out. There was a time that alongside Shibata and Nakamura and Tanahashi and the new wave of guys, it looked like he was going to get his chance. He had a tag team title reign with Hiroshi Tanahashi for about six months in 2003, but... That promotion, as a lot of people know, was going through a lot of upheaval at the time. There was a lot of shoot fighting influences. There were a lot of managerial issues, ownership issues, all that sorts of stuff. So he ended up leaving and joining Tatsumi Fujinami's uh, tradition group, the Muga World group. And from there, spent a lot of time there and then became a freelancer working for All Japan Pro Wrestling Noah. Was very close with Kensuke Sasaki working his Diamond Ring shows and his Kensuke office shows after he left New Japan. But 
Very sad. We'll have more on him today, later on today, because I'm doing a brand new admin, Mike Big Audio Nightmare, where we'll get it in, into his career a little bit more. As It was along with all the other stuff that's taking place in wrestling over the weekend. So the... Um... I don't know if we'll ever really get a. I, we might get a cause of death, but sometimes in Japan they they uh, they keep that kind of close to the vest. But uh, I was just watching last week a uh, WWE uh, challenge, nineteen eighty six, and uh, and who should appear on that show but Moon Dog Spot? I thought Moon Dog Spot. You know what happened to that guy? Well, he uh, he was having a match. And uh, and in the middle of the match, he just sat down in the corner and died. And he was 51. He was a year older than uh, than Yutaki Yoshie. And, uh, you know, he, he had a heart attack in the match. And um, just it happens sometimes. And I don't know if that's what happened with Yoshie, but, I mean, the people that were there, you know, they said didn't look like there was any spot. Didn't look like there was anything where, you know, hit his head or or anything. It was just had a match, went backstage, condition suddenly deteriorated was the way it was described, and he passed away. So, you Well, know. Brian, I mean, my heavens, it, 5'11", and that may be generous. He was probably 350 pounds. I mean, and that was the one thing about that gimmick, and it was one thing when you're a lot younger. Obviously, this is a lot of the times when it comes to football players, guys who play on the offensive and defensive lines, once they retire, you got to get some of that weight off your chest and all that sort of stuff. Well, this is the way he had always wrestled. This is the way he had always lived from the time he was a professional. But, you know, again, carrying around that much weight, it, it probably, even though we may never find out the exact cause of death, it is probably fair to say that it was something that probably had to do with his heart muhammad ali has now been announced for the wwe hall of fame we have got paul Heyman, bull nakano the u.s express and now muhammad ali first reported as it says here by variety they like to do that <laughs> they've got a uh should we read wwe's description of muhammad ali oh sure one of the most iconic figures in sports history Three-time world heavyweight boxing champion, Olympic gold medalist, known around the world for his charisma, confidence, ability to back it up inside the ropes. Known simply as the greatest, his influence transcended sports as his work as an activist, artist, and personality established him as one of the most renowned figures in the entire world. Although best known as a boxer, it says. He made a great impact in the sports entertainment world. Foray in his sports entertainment occurred in 1976. When he faced Antonio Noki in Japan, the match also aired on 150 closed circuit venues across the U.S. Story goes, Ali's camp expected the bout to be a work contest. Inoki's did not. I don't know if that's exactly what happened right there. Mm. Well, well, essentially, there, there's actually multiple versions of this story, but uh, you know the story that Dave has always told, which I have had people in Japan dispute this story, and I'm talking like people that write for the magazines over there. But his story is that, you know, they had agreed to do a, a worked contest. And then when they got there, like, bo I, I guess it was kind of like, well, you know, I can't agree on whatever. And so they just went in and they just did it. Well, Ali's side, did one of the things I'd always heard was kept wanting to change the rules. And basically it degenerated into where it was going to be a shoot because they did, were afraid of a work and how that was going to go. And would Inoki double cross him? And they got more tense as it went on. And then it ended up leading to what was an awful match by anyone's standards either at the time then or now i mean it's just insane but that was one of the jumping off points for mma to the point where antonio inoki is a legend in japan as an mma figure as much as he is a pro wrestling figure well he kicked the bejesus out of all these legs oh yeah and uh you know if if, if we were scoring this all he won the fight or i'm sorry uh um, inoki won the fight but it wasn't scored it went to a draw but uh, it did affect Ali's mobility, and it was the birth of, of mixed martial arts in a lot of ways in Japan. Anyway, more after the break. Observer Live. You know, that was a very special night for me. 
Um, and I've listened to Cody about it. It's not one of his, it's not his top match, he says, but man, it's mine. You know what I mean? It's uh, very special in my heart. And to do that at 50, right, is a, uh, it's just a, it's a great achievement for somebody like me, man. It really is to be in my kind of my, st my shape still in good shape to be able to go out there with the young, young kids and pull things off. Um, it's, it's so amazing. You know, when I was so nervous when we, you know, Cody's music hit and he broke the throne with a sledgehammer and all that, I'm just waiting for my, my entrance, right? And this new, upstart company AEW I didn't know how the fans would respond to me uh whether they would boo me or whether they would you know cheer me or whatever so I'm so nervous and I'm so laser focused on what I'm doing but it, it was like god my butterflies in my stomach were crazy my music hit and they responded in kind and I was like okay it's not so bad and I'm always like that as soon as I go through the tunnel it goes away Right. And then I'm laser focused on what I need to do, man. And it's like it was good to feel that reaction from the, a new fan base that had watched me my whole career. But they're different than WWE fans to go down there. And, you know, um, I've explained this before and it's let's see if you can understand it. I step in the ring. Right. And they start chanting Dusty's name. Right. Which really just. Oh man, you know, chills on your on your body. You're in the moment. You're so laser focused, and you hear that for a moment because I point to the to the sky. I point up, and they started to chant "Dusty," and then all of a sudden, the sound and everybody in the arena has become blurry to me. Right? I can hear them, but I can't hear them. I can see them, but I can't. I'm so focused on Cody and what we need to do right now to get it to where it is. Because for years and years, I was told, no, it wasn't good enough to be on WrestleMania or whatever. So we had a thing to prove here and I was focused about it. And we probably could have done a couple things wrong in that match and it still wouldn't have mattered. It was so good. The story was built in one promo a piece. They were ready for it. All the stars aligned, the magic happens. And we struck lightning and it was really cool to do. And I think that match will go down in history as, as, you know, one of the greatest matches of all time. You know, there's some great matches out there, but I think it really, it, it holds water. I think it, it's going to be talked about for 10 years from now, you know, 15, 20 years from now. Back on the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sabravivi, also WrestlingObserver.com. Hey, if you want to text us, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. I had to shut down the chat today. All right. I, I, like, I, like, the, I like the folks, but I, I couldn't do it today. They were all mad what at me. What is the bone of contention that's getting up? Well, I was accused of, of unfairly. You know, I, I rant about there was no collision lineup until the day of the show. They're like, well, why do you say the same thing about Raw? There's only one match. And I was like, there's three matches. They've had three matches for a week. One match. Now, there wasn't one match. There were three. So I had to shut the thing down. But I will do text messages. So if you are there and you want to contact me, 425-780-7566. And we can talk uh, whatever you want to talk about. But we do have plenty more here. John Cena and The Rock and Bad Bunny, all of the Academy Awards. You know, actually, we're kind of running out of time for old Bad Bunny. I thought he was going to be at Mania this year. I suppose it's possible. There's still time. They got a lot. Of I guess he doesn't have a path. Let's <laughs> see. <laughs> doesn't have a path to WrestleMania. His path should be Dominic Mysterio, where he beats Mysterio quickly. Do it that way. Uh, John Cena, The Rock, and Bad Bunny all presented awards. Cena did a uh, a nude gimmick. Oh, the, his his humiliation ritual. Yeah. And it, then uh, uh, the Rock that? was there as well, and he shook hands with Cena backstage. 
did did Cena have clothes on when they did? Uh, he had a toga on. I. So uh, did he really? <laughs> well, he had to put something on. Yes. Uh, heavens. When he met The Rock, though, he still had it on backstage. He still had his toga on backstage, yes. <laughs> Rock did not shake his hand while nude. So anyway, but in a toga, though, it's different. They, they were all over the place. <laughs> the Rock, John Cena, and Bad Bunny at the Academy Awards. We have got Revolution. <laughs> Just like Vince McMahon Sr. predicted. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Revolution is uh, coming in at about one hundred seventy to 176000 I actually thought it might get up to one ninety, which is possible because they have they have late buys, but that would be uh, up from World's End, which did one hundred forty one thousand, and uh, that's one of the biggest pay per views they have ever done. So Sting's Sting's retirement at the end of the day, you know that got people buying that show, and I know that were a lot of people in WWE that bought the show because they wanted to see Sting's retirement. Maybe they weren't allowed to go, like old Kevin Nash. He probably bought it. But uh, huge business for the Revolution show. $16,118 million gate. And do you know in the history of World Championship Wrestling, they never did a $1 million gate? Not one. Not Wild. one. Wild. They had one that was just just under. It was like 980000 or something like that. But they never broke the $1 million gate. Granted, that was 25 years ago. Tickets are much much uh, pricier here today. But uh, never hit a million-dollar gate for old world championship wrestling. We also have a new New Japan Strong Women's Champion. Stephanie Vacure beat Julia. Sunday stardom event. Cork and Hall won the title. So Julia, of course, is leaving stardom. As reported <laughs> like a month late by Tokyo Sports. She will be going to Rossi Ogawa's new promotion. She's going to help him get that thing off the ground. And then she will be on her way to WWE. So when that will be, I don't know. I don't know how long it officially takes to get a promotion off the ground. But uh, that is her next couple of stops. Those two. <laughs> they had to take it off of her sooner or later. So why not Stephanie back here or... Vacker, or I, I've heard it pronounced about a zillion different ways, and great. You know, she seems. I to be pronounce getting... it differently in my head, but when my mouth opens, a different word comes out. That happens a it, lot with me. It, 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 as you get older, this is just going to get worse and worse. But yeah, know. you know, I see Stephanie Vacquer, and then, you know, Rocky's on. He calls her Vacker, so I'm just going to go ahead and go with that. He, he should know best, but she's been getting a lot more shine outside of Mexico in the last year, and this really only makes sense for that title. To me, it's a superfluous title. I wish they would either just have the New Japan Strong Women's title or the IWGP Women's title. I don't think that there's a need for both of them, but... Hey, great. She gets to have one of them, gets to be around North America a lot, and is probably going to show up a lot more in the state. So, you know, that was probably the best option they could have went with. All right. Well, we had uh, a lot of shows this past weekend. We had the Collision Show and the SmackDown Show. And uh, I cannot wait to get the SmackDown ratings because they put Rock, they put him at the end of the show. And we talked about this last week. The thing with The Rock is, it's hard to reel this guy in. You know what I'm saying? And once he gets going, he'll just talk and talk and talk and talk. And so last week, they put him at the beginning of the show because he can just talk till he's done. And then you move on. It was 40 minutes of SmackDown. And what happened was, everybody watched, and then as soon as he was gone, they all shut off the show. So then you think, okay, well, let's keep him to the end. Because when you keep him to the end, you do a better number throughout the show. So uh, so they, they kept him until the end this time. And the key was he didn't have to do a lot of talking. He did a little talking, but he only had to say, like, one big line. And then Cody slaps him and they go off the air. And it'll be interesting to see how the show does because uh, this is going to be the highest rating for nothing happening in <laughs> I don't even know how long. So at the end of the show... They start trotting these guys out at, uh, like, 9.35 or something like that. So, first, Rock and Roman come down to the ring. Seven minutes and 30 seconds just for them to do a ring entrance. <laughs> then Roman stands in the ring for a long, long time. 
And then finally he says, acknowledge us. So then they hit Cody's music, and then they hit Seth's music, and they have a commercial. And so there was literally 15 straight minutes of absolutely nothing but entrances and uh, and two words, acknowledge us. And I expected to do like 2.8 million viewers for that nothing. And then the, the big angle at the end was, you know, they're talking back and forth. And Rock wants to know if they accepted the challenge. What is the challenge? The challenge is Rock and Roman versus Cody and Seth on the first night of WrestleMania. If Cody and Seth win, there is no bloodline interference on Sunday. So Cody can just go finish his story and nobody's going to run in from the bloodline. And that's the story. However, however, if rock and roman reigns win then it will be bloodline rules which is essentially they can do whatever they want they can have solo sokoa as the referee they can have jimmy try to ring the bell i mean they can do whatever they want and here's the key because this is an old school thing that they did they basically told you if you pay your money on night two you will see cody win the title because Rock added the stipulation that I am on the board. I am on the TKO board. I own part of this company. I am your boss. I make the rules. And does this sound familiar? Let me tell you something, Cody. If you don't win, if you don't beat Roman Reigns, you can never challenge for this title again. And he didn't say you can never challenge Roman again. He made it very clear you can never challenge for this title again. So it's an old school thing they do in wrestling where they basically tell you, like, you know, if you pay your money, you're going to see this person win. So they've they've done everything except tell you he's winning. So anyway, that was the uh, main event segment. And then the big line was, uh, Rock says, uh, my, my Roman's grandfather is proud of... Of this, my grandfather is proud. Your father, Cody, one of my heroes. He is looking down, also proud. And you know, Cody, you're the youngest of three, aren't you? Your sister was a cheerleader for the Dallas Cowboys. That gets a pop. Your brother, first he says he's a Hall of Famer, then he realizes that he's actually not. He's a future Hall of Famer. And then he says, and you're 20 years younger than your siblings, right? Wait, stop right there. Can we do a split screen, please? Because as this is going on, there is a man outside of the ring in production that is desperately trying to let these men know that they have got to go. We got to go. Well, Rock says, because you were... We can do it, Jared. No, we can't. We Uh, can do it. Oh, hold on. Hold on. There we go. I'll start over again. You're the youngest of three. Your sister was a cheerleader for the Dallas Cowboys. Your brother is a future Hall of Famer. And you're 20 years younger than your siblings, right? Because you were a mistake. And when he calls Cody a mistake, the fans gasped. They were like, whoa. And then Cody... Cody's like, he gets that look on his face like, oh my God, I can't believe he just said that. And then he starts bringing the mic up like he's going to say something. And he's just, he brings it down and bam, he slaps a rock across the face. And Rock's like, oh man, brother, it's on. And right then they go off the air. So it wasn't really like a cliffhanger because it's not like they're going to, you know, next week you're going to tune in and they're going to like be in the exact same spots. But I, I do think that. You know, if, you, if you're talking about, like, a, a segment that's going to drive people to social media to try to find out what happened after the show went off the air, that feels like one of those segments. But anyway, that was the main gist of the show because that's the main match. And I thought they all did a great job. Back in a moment, Observer Live.
Okay. No, thank you. Bye. We're never going to see him again, are we? Hey guys! What's up? Vince, what in the hell are you wearing? I was down on my luck. I was desperate. I was covered with snakes and twigs and swamp water. And then this little old lady, she gave me one dollar bill. And I took that one dollar, and I went into a casino, and I turned one dollar into one million dollars. And now I am rich! And I'm hungry. So hop on the ride, boys, because dinner's on Vinny V. So I guess I will be needing this then. Well, first off, I want to mention the uh, F4W convention is coming up in Vegas. It's going to be very exciting. It's that time of year. We look ahead to our annual F4W Observer Convention set for Vegas this May during Memorial Day weekend. Welcome current subscribers, past subscribers, friends, family, wrestlers, pets. Anyone else who wants to come along? I'll decide tomorrow about people on Twitch. As always, there's a lot happening starting on Friday. We've got an annual all-you-can-eat dinner at Texas de Brazil. That's a real highlight, let's be honest. Tejas. Meet and greet with, uh, well, we'll get with to meat. that in a moment. That, that's, you're going to be eating meat. So there's a big meet and greet at the, uh, the Tejas de Brazil. Live, uh, uh, it, it's Texas, let's be honest. Live pro wrestling in the FSW arena as Ed once again presents Poder Seis. Actually, this will be the first time he promoted Poder Seis. <laughs> Sweet party with details to come, an annual brunch at the Wicked Spoon. And yes, this year, well, life happens. Dave is, is uh, he's unavailable that weekend. And so we will be doing a meet and greet and live Q&A for the first time ever, Brian and Vinny. Oh, my. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. How much is this costing you for Vinny to do this? Are you kidding me? He's blessed to go. But uh, buy your tickets or it'll be the first and last. Put it that way. So we hope to see you in Vegas this May. You never know, it says, who might show up. Well, I hope filthy when he lives there. So you can either uh, go to my Twitter, X, at Brian Alvarez. It's stickied up there at the top. Or uh, the easy way is you can go to f4wonline.com. You ready for this? Yes. Slash Vegas. It's pretty easy. easy. Yeah. F4wonline.com. Slash Vegas. What is it, Mike? F4Wonline.com uh, slash Vegas? Exactly. That's right. what it is. Yes. And Do you so ever feel you. bad that, you know, when people go to cage match and they look up promoters that they see the name Edward Laredo? I mean, do you ever, like, feel bad that you have unleashed Ed the promoter How many on the times world? do you think I have gone <laughs> to cage match, like... Nothing against cage match. They're all fine and everything like that. 
But uh, never once have I gone on there for anything other than a bit on this radio show. But because so it did not bother me. But you have unleashed. I didn't unleash it. He did this himself. He did this himself. I had nothing to do with any of this. No, that's this is not on me. That's all on Ed. By the way, this person here says, "Tell the Chad the problem with AEW is not announcing matches. The problem is announcing who will even be on the show." WWE has an advantage with their split rosters because fans have a general idea who will be on whatever show they're attending. Oh, no. But because AEW does not have dedicated rosters, fans are left wondering who's on the show. That's why it's important for AEW to announce matches or appearance weeks in advance so fans know what to expect. After and you know the all, other thing? What? I'm glad I'm not on, on the chat right now because people will really get mad. When people go, well, how can we say about it? About, uh, how can we say it about AEW but not WWE? Even though I actually did today, and even though WWE Raw does have matches announced, let's say that Raw had no matches announced. Okay, I'm sorry, it's not the same thing. Okay, because one of them is selling out shows weeks in advance, and one of them is doing two thousand people for. Uh, I think they did uh, three thousand for uh, Dynamite and two thousand for Collision. So I'm sorry, it's not the same thing, okay? They've announced CM Punk for a match three weeks from now that's already sold 12,000 tickets. If they announce... Listen, do I want them to announce a full card in advance? Well, of course. Should they? Yes. Do they need to? No. Whereas with AEW, do I want them announcing a card in advance? Yes. Do they need to announce a card in advance? Yes. Is it a problem if they don't? Actually, yes. When they're doing 5,000 people per show, 6,000 people per, per show for television, then it wouldn't be as big a deal. You're selling plenty of tickets and you're selling in advance. When you got 1,800 tickets sold two days before the show and there's still no lineup, that's a problem. If, if Raw had no, if SmackDown Friday had no matches announced, okay, should they? Yes. Is it a problem? No. That's the key, everybody. Is it a problem? Right now, WWE isn't having a problem. I love AEW, too. I know it's some of your favorite promotion. I know some of you, it's the only thing you want to watch. That's great, okay? But 1,800 tickets, 2,000 tickets, 3,000 for a dynamite. That's a problem. They should be doing more. They have been doing more. They had a dynamite that last time they went did over 5,000. This week, it did this, this past Wednesday, it did 3,000. They're down 2,000. That's a problem, okay? It doesn't mean I don't like Dynamite. doesn't mean I don't like AEW, okay? But it could be doing better. It should be doing better. And this is not hard. And it's not a same... It's not the same. They're not. Why did I read that text? I don't know why you read God! that text. <laughs> but in, Am I a mark? It's <laughs> W... WWE should be selling out all of their shows right now with nobody on it because they're on the road to WrestleMania, they're WWE, and they have these shows that everybody knows are going to feature something leading into WrestleMania. So, frankly, as long as they're hot, they could announce nothing. You should expect those shows to sell out or at least do very well because they're in a good position. Now, with AEW, they're not in a good position. But people trying to compare things, to me, that's just... It's too much. They need to work on things. We've talked about it ad nauseum here on this show. There are levels to things that they need to work on, but the whole package kind of needs work right now. And the things that are being suggested, I completely agree with. But the person that says we need a brand split because people are going to know. No, they're not saying we need a brand split. They're just saying because WWE has a brand split, you know who's going to be on the shows. But that's silly because in some ways, AEW has got that brand split. Now, you know, for sure, Saturday, you're going to see the house of black or thunder Rosa as opposed to Wednesday. That's because they don't go Wednesday, but like Danielson's on both shows. I know, but Jackson's Okada line is a split roster. Wouldn't help that situation right now because they are lagging in other areas is including being just very cold right now and they need to heat things back up so to me any idea or any romanticism of a brand well no he's not saying they need a brand split and he doesn't want them to have a brand split he's just saying that you don't have a brand split and so unlike in wwe you know you don't know okay well you know whoever damage control is almost going to be on they'll be on every single friday show if friday's coming you know damage control will be there actually you do they're always there 
but that the thing is, okay, Roman Reigns is technically a SmackDown wrestler. How many times was he on SmackDown? Well, they you know? announced Roman Reigns weeks in advance if he's going to be on the show. Well, that's the thing because then he, you know, for the so last you know he's going to be there year or so. He had weeks off where he wasn't going well, exactly. To be there, but you're right; they did advertise him and all that. I just think that to me is just it, it just kind of muddies the waters in the conversation, and I don't think it really helps. So the Collision Show, this was a better show. Although, hey, Brian and Vinny's show last night, Tara was on the show, prediction contest winner. You're not going to find a bigger AEW fan. She went to Revolution, Dynamite, Rampage, and Collision. And even she said it was sad. There was 2,000 people in the building. It was quiet. And there were way more last time. But the show itself, I mean, it was a good show. Brian Danielson and Shane Taylor was a great match because Brian Danielson is great. And then they brought out Willa, and Shane Taylor's great as well. But uh, you're not going to get anything resembling a bad match with Brian Danielson. And then Osprey came out afterwards, who was like the biggest star on the show. I don't want to get into that rant again. But uh, he challenged Brian to a match coming up at this uh, Dynasty pay-per-view. And Brian accepted. And so away we go. You know what's going to do really well business-wise? What you think? Dynasty. <laughs> think so we're announcing matches long in advance they're big matches with big stars they're gonna sell a lot of tickets well they're gonna sell a lot of tickets for sure how many pay-per-views are, we, are they going to sell that's gonna be 140 gonna be very interesting easy i would say hmm. met nick jackson and okada sort of face three poor blokes <laughs> the story of this match was okada demanded to get tagged in and uh and keep in mind you know it's not a big deal, but, like, Okada's a heel and the Jacksons are heels. But Okada gets in the ring. He single-handedly, one-on-three, beats up and destroys three men, pins one of them with a rainmaker, goes, like, 30 seconds, kills all these guys. Then Eddie Kingston tries to hit the ring. He gets beat up. And then Pac returns, and Okada beats him up. He's beat up five men. Well, beat up okay? the first. Ch- the fans are chanting for Okada's name. They're chanting Okada because he's like a huge baby face, beating up five men by himself. But then they, uh, the tables got turned, and uh, and Pac came down and uh, ran off Okada. And they announced a six-person tag coming up this week. Pac is back. And uh, hopefully back for the long haul at this point. We yeah, had really- Trish... What was it the last time? It Was it he broke his nose? Was that the last injury that he had put him on the shelf? Listen, I don't know what happened, okay? I don't know what happened. But Pac was gone, and apparently it was like a pretty serious issue. But now he's back, and he looks healthy. I don't know what happened, but hopefully everything stays well with him. Trisha Dora and Mariah May. Uh, Mariah beat her. Do I got to say it? No? Okay, I won't. And then afterwards, Tony and Luther came out on the stage, and here's another one. So Tony says, I'm going to present the first ever Tony Award. The nominees are Mariah May. She's the only nominee. The winner is Mariah May. So, of course, it's a total heel thing. She presents her. She's going to give her the award, which is a shoe. But uh, Deanna Parazzo runs down. She attacks Tony. She hits her with the shoe. But Mariah makes a save, gives Tony a DDT on the ramp, lays her out. Tony gives Mariah the shoe, and the fans chant, You deserve it. I think what they need to do with Deanna is take her off TV for one month and then bring her back as a heel. Because this baby face thing is not working at all. It does not work from the moment she showed up. Ryan, I, 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 look, I agree with you. They did not. But I think a lot of this is the fact that you get sucked into the Tony Storm vortex and you die. And Mariah May, who showed a lot more in the ring and a lot more, frankly, personality and charisma-wise and stardom, now is playing Tony Storm's understudy, which, okay, fine. That's okay. That's what you're doing. But she hasn't looked good in the... Look, she's looked okay. She's looked fine. But Trisha Dora stood out more in their match. Lady Frost stood out more in their match. And anybody... Oh, good. Now you can get in trouble. 
I don't care. Anybody that gets sucked into this Tony Storm vortex, as much as I like the character, what they were doing, all that stuff, there's a problem with people not having good matches and not getting over with her and her just basically chewing up and literally bigfooting everything. The gimmick is actually too much for, you know, what's supposed to be happening in the ring. And if Mercedes Monet, which I am praying is her next feud because I don't want to see any more. I'm getting to the point where I don't want to see Tony Storm at all. And that sucks because I know she can go. But it just seems as if everybody that gets put into her universe just gets chewed up and spit out. And the only person that's over is Tony Storm. And it's all for laughs and comedy and goofs, but it's not for good matches. And we'll see. Like I said, I'm giving this, I'm giving it to her and Monet. And if they can make something out of it, great. But it's getting to the point where I don't want to see you. Well, now that we're out of time, I can tell you that Nick Wayne and Adam Priest had a very good match. Well, it was a showcase for Nick. Jericho and Teton was good. Mystico and Angelico I loved. And I, I actually really enjoyed House of Black versus Jarrett, Jay Lethal, and Mark Briscoe. Although, I don't like fire. Can we stop with the fire already? How about give Mark Briscoe a win? <laughs> well, him and Trisha Dora are on track for 2029 for their big win. Back in a moment, Observer Live. Tonight's Portland Wrestling Card, Ed Moondog Moretti versus beautiful Brian Alvarez. This match is being brought to you in part by Tom Peterson. What an amazing match we just had. And Tony Kazina and Damon Scythe tore it down. I do not know, Mike Rogers, glad to have you back. LC, I, I couldn't take much more of them. Mike, glad to have you here. Moondog Ed Moretti, Brian Alvarez, beautiful Brian Alvarez in the ring. I have never seen Tony Kazina that upset. Oh, that was unbelievable. And uh, yeah, I've never seen him that upset either. And, uh, and I'm telling you, if, if you don't want to be upset, I guess you just look over there and see Miss Rent to Own Auto. Yeah, yeah, Miss Rent to Own Auto. There she is with beautiful Brian Alvarez. And she was none too happy last week when Brian Alvarez was pinned by the grappler. One, two, three in the middle of the ring. I'm telling you, fans, Ed Moretti, veteran, 24 years, locking up with beautiful Brian Alvarez, drives a knee into the midsection, whips him across the ropes, off he comes up, another knee, really drives him in. Ed Moretti, Oklahoma roll, there he's got him down, there's a pin, one, two, no, almost a three count. A move you haven't seen, Miss Brito Onato not looking very happy there with beautiful Brian Alvarez and the effort that he's putting forth tonight. But fans, coming up next in our main event, the Suicide Kings versus Havoc and Mac. Again, double count out last week. Those two teams want to settle the score. Mike Rogers, I'm not sure the arena's big enough to hold them. Oh, it, you know, they're going to take off right where they left off last week. And, uh, yeah, I don't know if this arena can hold the action that's, that we're in store for in that main event. Action like this each and every Saturday night, WB32, 11 p.m., Portland Wrestling. Ed Moretti, the veteran in the ring, whips him into the rope, drop kick for a big man, really got up high, there's a pin, one, two, hooks the leg, third man in the ring, Mark Watson almost with a three count, you don't see agility like that very often from a man of that size. No, you know, he's a big man, there's no doubt about that, and here we've seen two moves now that uh, usually would be considered little man moves, the Oklahoma roll and a big drop kick, and I know Ed Moretti was very upset last week getting pinned in the ring by Robbie Lentz, a rookie. It hasn't happened to Ed in a long time. And that was quite the upset, absolutely. Looking to get back on track here. Whips him into the ropes. Oh my gosh, did he hit hard upside down into the turnbuckle, off he comes. Big back body drop. Beautiful Brian Alvarez up and down. Miss Rinthorn really, I think she's looking for someone else already. Splash off the ropes, nobody home. There's the agility, Brian Alvarez with the Oklahoma roll himself, what? Back on the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Simber, VV, also WrestlingObserver.com. Well, as always, I don't know what we're going to talk about Tom today, but he is on. 
And uh, we'll be up at 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern to talk about, uh, presumably, the uh, SmackDown show, the Collision show, maybe the Rampage show. Seen them all. And I uh, actually reviewed them a bunch yesterday on the uh, Brian and Vinny show with Craig and Tara, which was an excellent show if you've not heard it yet. So go up there and check that out. And uh, that's the plan. Then later on tonight, Dave. Haven't done a show with Dave since Wednesday. Garrett had it this weekend. So we'll have a lot to talk about with Dave coming up here tonight. And uh, and that's the plan. So don't forget Raw. If you want to check out uh, my Raw report, SmackDown, all those reports, they're up for subscribers at WrestlingObserver.com. That's a new feature we've got. And uh, don't forget the convention. What's the address, Mike? F4WOnline.com slash Vegas. Very good. What if you go to WrestlingObserver.com slash Vegas? I think it still works. All right. But anyway. How about FTheSnow.com slash Vegas? You know, I had that for a long time, but finally I was like, I'm paying I'm paying $25 a year for this? Why? I'm sure it's worth probably a lot of money now, but. Old school. Hey, we're going to wrap it up today. I want to thank Mike, as always, callers and listeners, everybody in the studio. Tomorrow I will, uh, I'll try the chat again. But uh, don't make me move to the YouTube chat. I mean, it shouldn't get to that point. But that's it, everybody. We'll talk to you next time. Wrestling Observer Live.